Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to another Eurocontrol Aviation Straight Talk Live. This is the program where we talk to the industry leaders in the aviation industry, not just airlines, of course, but the entire aviation ecosystem. And today, it's our enormous pleasure to welcome Mr. Red Sims, who is the Chief Executive of WestJet, based in Calgary in Canada. Uh, we're going to talk today about the situation in North America. We're going to talk about the situation in Canada and, of course, across the Atlantic because they are all areas of enormous concern for the aviation industry globally. But before we do that, as ever on Straight Talk, uh, I'm going to ask the Director General of Eurocontrol, Mr Raymond Brennan, if he'd bring us up to date with the current industry situation. Eamon, if you'd be so kind. Good afternoon from Brussels and good morning to everybody in Canada and welcome to another Eurocontrol Aviation Straight Talk. And I very much welcome our host today, Andrew, and of course our guest, Ed Sims, who as a Welshman has had a very happy weekend celebrating the Guinness Triple Crown winners, which they celebrated last weekend. So as normal, I just want to give you a quick update on what's happening in Europe. The general trend in the network, slight increase over the last two weeks, about 8%, but this harsh reality is we are still 65% of a reduction on 2019. So all of these quarantines and PCR tests and everything are having a huge negative effect on the network. And I'll deal with that um, in a moment. But most of the flights at the moment are cargo or internal operations in the UK and France and Spain in Italy. We're getting very little point-to-point um, -point international travel in Europe. I think it's worthwhile looking at where is the travel and what the type of travel that's happening. Cargo has increased by 9% over the last number of weeks. Business jets, huge reduction by 23%. And you can see that you know, over three quarters of the market, which is legacy carriers and low cost carriers are down between 72 and 82 percent and 87 percent. So it's a real disaster for aviation what's happening for Europe at the moment. And I'm sure that you'll find a similar case when you look at North America from Ed in a few moments. Looking at the top 10 airlines in Europe over the last um, week or so. And if you look at, for instance, yesterday, Monday, the 1st of March, you can see that the number one airline in the network um, had a 48% reduction over what it had in 2019. That was Turkish. Also, it's interesting to see that Turkish is also in number four with Pegasus, an internal carrier. And look at number eight, Ryanair, 91% reduction. And what's interesting is you don't even see airlines like Whiz Air there. So um, basically, we're seeing a very difficult week for airlines and there's no bright future I think until after airline uh, after Easter until we get the vaccine situation rolled out um, more substantively. Looking at the airport situation you can see for instance that the most um, busy airport yesterday was Istanbul uh, and this was has been shown consistently throughout the pandemic with a large internal operation in Turkey Charles de Gaulle, again benefiting from an internal operation in France and cargo, uh, did very well. And Schiphol, of course, which is a major cargo hub, has also performed well. And Frankfurt, and coming in at number five, Madrid Baracus. Nowhere there do you see London Heathrow. And there's a lot of airports really just about managing to survive, particularly smaller regional airports. And there's a huge threat to European regional connectivity happening at the moment. This brings me, of course, to the vaccine status. The big controversy in Europe at the moment is how fast can we roll out the vaccine? Um, individuals like myself all over Europe have become experts on what's the best vaccine and what type of vaccine. I mean, would you ever ask um, a doctor two years ago, what was the brand of the flu vaccine you're getting? But now it seems that everybody is into this and uh, it's really topical in Europe at the moment. But I do see some progress in Europe because there's a good discussion going on about the whole area of certifying vaccines. And, you know, there's a different debate in each European country at the moment. But it's important to see that we are now getting traction from the European Union and from the UK and from other states as well, Israel as well, on the whole question of a vaccine passport. And even as far away as Singapore and in the Gulf states, we are seeing this becoming really, really important. And I think it's important to recognise, you know, that um, 
the, uh, the decision by the Commission to draft a law on vaccine passports this month is really to be welcomed and it will give us some hope to open up borders. And this is something I would like to see replicated throughout the world. It will be really helpful. Looking at Canada, you know, Canada has suffered very similar to Europe. You know, in February we had only 30% of the 2019 operations. Intercontinental Canadian operations have virtually ceased except from cargo. So you're seeing some domestic operations, but really operating basically at less than a third of what they were in 2019. You know, WestJet, I welcome Ed here today, but they're a group that has done extraordinarily well over the last 10 years. Under Ed's leadership, they've had 26 million passengers in 2019. Interestingly, they're, they're an operator of the Boeing 737 MAX, and we've had all the controversy about that. And of course, they purchased a fleet of 787s. But like every other airline in Europe and all over the world, they've been impacted by COVID. Looking at jobs been slashed, you know, revenue falling off. And this is the story all throughout the uh, value chain of aviation, where we're seeing workers being laid off and very difficult employment conditions at the moment. Something that governments will have to address over the next number of months. So really, to kind of end up, I just want to say to Ed, who's a Welshman, it's important that we acknowledge that uh, coming from Ireland, that uh, Wales are the triple crown winners of 2021. And to hand over from Brussels to um, Andrew, who'll take uh, Ed through his paces. Best of luck, guys. So, Ed, a remarkable history, a, a movement from, from Tui to Thomas Cook, Virgin Air New Zealand, Airways New Zealand. In the middle of that, Ed, so you're, and Eamon made very clear that everyone realised that you were born a Welshman. You went to an English university to study an Irish writer. You then moved to the United to, to England. You then you moved to New Zealand, indeed became a New Zealander, and now you live in Canada. Where's home? Well, I can run through all the accents, mate, that I've lived in and it's been becoming a question, and now I can talk like Justin Trudeau. Hey. Um, everybody has your back. So where is home? That's a great question, Andrew. Home right now is Calgary in Canada. Uh, I love Canadians. I love the country. People have been very kind to me. The aviation industry here and the structure is immensely challenging. Um, I would say the hardest I've ever worked in any of the environments. And that comes from someone who's gone through two airline collapses, one in Europe in uh, 1991, one in Australia in 2001. Um, not only the current circumstances, but just the way the aviation system is structured here and just the sheer daily reality of operating through temperatures of minus 50 on the ground. Just the, the whole infrastructural setup here is the hardest. Um, but in answer to your question, this is home. Uh, my wife and my youngest child are here. And, uh, and I'm just loving the opportunity, notwithstanding how challenging the last 12 months have been. They have been challenging. What, what is the situation in Canada at the moment? Yeah, maybe uh, a few data points might help. I mean, Eamon uh, started this morning by talking about Europe being down 65%. The US currently, we think, is down somewhere around 58% because, as, as you'll be aware, and many of your viewers will be aware, the CARES Act actually funds people to fly, the opposite of what happened in France, where Air France were, were sponsored not to fly for environmental reasons. So the US is down 58%. Canada is down 91%. And has been consistently. I mean, if I look at the stats for WestJet, I've lost 70% of my staff. So I started COVID exactly this time last year with 14,500 people. I'm now operating with 4,500 people, which is brutally tough. We've parked 80% of our aircraft, uh, including obviously the Boeing Maxes, as Eamon also referred to, uh, that were only recently ungrounded. But we've been operating generally between 10 to 15% of our previous guest count and revenue, currently we're operating between five to 10%. So it's impossible to overstate quite how challenging um, the demand environment has been. And there's a number of reasons, not just the well-publicized international quarantines, border controls, now mandatory hotels akin to um, the UK and parts of Europe, uh, but also even interprovincial constraints. So we've had provinces, as you'll be aware, and I'm sure most of your viewers are aware, we are a confederation. 
uh, we have 10 provinces and territories, many of whom operate quite independently of the federal government, and many of whom have created their own barriers or their own bubble, as they like to call them, for domestic and interprovincial travel. So, uh, you know, if you name a challenge in the aviation industry in the last 12 months, WestJet has been battling through it. Yeah, that's um, we're seeing that in a lot of countries, aren't we? You know, in interprovincial or interstate or whatever, and of course in Europe, intra intra European restrictions as well. But you mentioned the CARES Act in the United States. One of the really interesting things I think about Canada at the moment is that a number of your really largest competitors around the world have received huge amounts of state aid, about two hundred billion dollars, according to IATA, one hundred ninety seven. But none has been handed out to airlines in Canada at all. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, it must upset you a little bit. Well, I don't, I don't use the word scandalous lightly, but it is a scandalous and extraordinary situation. Why, uh, so why, why did it this. happen this way? Why did it happen? Uh, I think the government, well, I think it happened in two major phases. One, the government were very wary of giving what they call sector-specific support. So that wasn't just pinpointing the aviation industry and refusing to support aviation. They, they treated uh, our resource industries, oil and gas, uh, in the same way. But I think what's happened lately is that there has been a lot of flight shaming, not in the environmental European sense, but in the sense of public leaders, particularly politicians, taking international breaks at a time when the prime minister has re-emphasized a number of times, that it's almost a, an act of uh, lack of patriotism or national disunity to be traveling internationally. But if I come back to the CARES Act, you know, major carriers, major competitors of ours like United, like American have received six, seven billion dollars in the first wave of the CARES Act and then in the two subsequent uh, acts of the payroll uh, support plan. Canada has a wage subsidy in place that gave about a little over a billion dollars to all carriers, but in fact, that was a wage subsidy to all industries, irrespective of aviation. Outside of that, there has been absolutely nothing. And that, in a way, there is a silver lining. It doesn't put constraints on board positions or warrants or equity shares. It prevents us from essentially becoming semi-nationalized. So all of that is a positive. But the big negative is that we're operating every single day at an enormous structural disadvantage to Lufthansa, to Air France, to Delta, KLM, um, United. And during the course of the, in the decision of the government not to provide funding for ourselves or our largest uh, legacy carrier, we have lost 23% market share to international carriers. And I think that is disgraceful uh, because in any other industry, in our aluminum, in our agricultural industry, in our resource industry, People would simply wouldn't tolerate that. But I think because aviation has been tainted somehow as an agent, an agent of spread, not as we see ourselves as an agent of containment of COVID, then the government simply have not been able to garner enough support in popularity polls wow. to warrant intervening on behalf of the airlines. I assume your aluminum industry is actually your aluminium industry, but um, we'll skip over the, too long. We'll, we'll skip over that point. I'm, why do you say aviation is, a, is a, a vector for containment? Because you're right. I mean, most people do see aviation as a vector for spread. Well, let me look at the current numbers. So we've had just a little under 900,000 of confirmed cases in Canada over the last 12 months. And sadly, uh, 22,000 deaths uh, emanating from those cases. If I look at the spread rate nationally in the country, it's around 3.5%. If I look at the spread rate, as we have been tracking it relentlessly through pre and post departure testing, the spread coming from international and domestic travel is somewhere around one and a half percent. So we can say with some conviction that whether it's HEPA filters, whether it's uh, hygiene factors, whether it's mandatory masks, that we uh, put teeth behind that legislation on September the 1st, we've taken all those necessary steps. And we have been, as I said, tracing at major airports like Toronto Pearson, uh, like Calgary Airport, the exact positivity rate 
of travellers, and it is below the national average. Do you so require travellers to do a test before an or before boarding? Well, one of the challenges of the Confederation and the kind of misalignment of provinces to federal has been that this itself has been a patchwork. So we introduced a test pilot, what we called a test pilot of arrival testing uh, into Calgary Airport in the last week of October. We tested over 50,000 guests and we had a positivity rate from those 50,000 guests of around 1.3% uh, on arrival. Uh, similarly, at Pearson, they tested around 60,000 guests, a uh, positivity rate, I think, of about 1.4. We are also doing a pre-departure testing at Vancouver Airport with a positivity rate of zero, absolute zero. So I think we can say with absolute conviction, we are certainly not part of the problem. We can't always guarantee as an industry that someone hasn't either you know, knowingly tested positive and boarded a flight or simply is completely unconscious of being symptomatic. But I think we can say in all conviction, we are not spreading the disease. And in many ways, I think a lot of the actions we've taken and continue to take, like the shifting of PPE, like the shifting of emergency workers, increasingly, I have now over 800 WestJetters who put their hands up to be part of the distribution of vaccines when they arrive in this country, where we are already massively behind the global rate of distribution. Uh, and then I think we can say with absolute conviction that our people are part of containment. Right. What's your, what's your thinking then to take that to the next step? And, and Eamon mentioned this as well. You'll know that Alan Joyce at Qantas has said, if, you don't have a, if you're not vaccinated, you can't fly. So that sort of takes us to the question of vaccine certificates. What's your view on that? Look, it's, uh, it's early days for us. Um, back in the first week of January, for, it's a real struggle to remember uh, January, let alone last year. But back in the first week of January, Canada and the UK were about neck and neck in terms of vaccine distribution. Uh, we distributed about 2% of the population. Let's move forward six weeks. The UK has now vaccinated almost a third, uh, over 20 million people, and we are still at 2%. So mm -hmm. Canada as a country has slipped from about sixth in the world of vaccination distribution now to mid 60s. So it's really hard for us to start talking to our population about mandatory vaccine passports when we don't have vaccines in the country. So our first stage is to get these vaccines in the country, then work on the distribution. And that at that same point, look at our policy with regards to vaccine passports as part of the removal of constraints like border closures and mandatory quarantines. My personal view, and as the, the head of this airline, I am very supportive. I am very supportive of the work that Qantas have been doing, and I'm very supportive of the work IATA are doing with regards to the passport. But regulation and legislation is obviously different in every country. I mentioned mandatory masks. We went to mandatory masks. In fact, we built in a yellow and red card scheme for recidivist non-mask wearers back in September, way, way ahead of the US. But there are significant privacy concerns uh, within Canada, Canadian legislation, and those are going to have to be overcome before we get widespread support for vaccine passports. Right. From my perspective, I think we should be leading the way. I think pilots and, and flight attendants should be amongst the first to be getting vaccinated so that when demand recovers, we can welcome people on board saying you are in a 100% vaccinated environment. Wow. Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned earlier, Ed, was, was the fact that having had no state aid, you've avoided some of the nationalisation stuff. Do you, do you think that after the, after the crisis ends, that we'll see more consolidation? And, and is there any chance of that being cross-border, do you think? I think some of what's happening at the moment is very insidious because it's almost hidden in the, the overarching ambition of uh, containing this disease and restoring demand. But if I look at a couple of things, you know, from the government's perspective, they have two major issues that they claim are barriers to providing aid. One is uh, the issue around refunds. And uniquely in Canada, the government would like us to pay a refund before they even start talking about financial relief, wow. which is an unusual uh, order. But the second is around routes. Now, sadly, ourselves and our major competitor have had to suspend some domestic bases. We've had to cancel regional routes. 
and the government see it as their role to insist that we restore those routes irrespective of changes in regulation. That is the path to nationalization. Mm. I think when you start allowing a national government to determine your network structure, you have lost part of your identity. And that does concern me greatly, as does the, the share shift that I mentioned um, to US carriers. There will undoubtedly be further consolidation. Right now here in Canada, uh, we are watching very closely a potential consolidation between Air Canada and Air Transat. That's been mooted now for over two years. It was slammed in no uncertain terms by the Competition Bureau within Canada, who said undoubtedly it would reduce competition and force up prices. And yet it was approved by the government. Why? And it's now subject to European... Well, I, it baffles me because what is the point of having a Competition Bureau if they could be so un unequivocal in their ruling? only for that to be effectively sailed past uh, by the government who determined that the post-COVID landscape had so fundamentally changed the competitive environment that one of those two parties was almost now deemed a failing firm. I think the opposite. I think the post-COVID landscape actually creates a greater need for competition than there's ever been. And it does concern me greatly uh, that there may be changes to, for example, foreign investment rules with regards to private equity investing in new carriers that would not have been tolerated pre-COVID. For me, the pandemic has changed nothing about our regulatory and legislative environment, and yet is being used, I think, as an umbrella for changes that would otherwise be deemed unacceptable in any other circumstances. But, well, let me make sure I understand that. What you're saying is that the, the pandemic has created the capacity for ownership and control shifts, if you like, or, you know, owned by non-aviation interests. But do you think it'll see transborder consolidation or, or not? I think, I think it is possible, uh, Andrew. I think, uh, you know, obviously the US carriers are preoccupied with many of their own issues at the moment. And many of them have equity shares in other parts of the world, like Latin mm. America, that are probably of greater concern. But I think at some stage, when we look to resurrect the sheer volume, if you think about the relationship between the USA and Canada, it's the single biggest land border in the world. We, as the second largest carrier in Canada, were flying to 28 ports on a daily basis within the US. So this is a thriving market. It's bigger north-south than it is south-north, but it's a very vibrant market. And I think it is highly likely um, that there will be consolidation and merger, largely on the basis of failing firm arguments that somebody had to pick these up. Mm. What I think we need to understand, and I'm sure uh, your viewers will understand in Europe is that Canada is an extraordinary position to have two equally robust national and international carriers. Neither of us came into this crisis with weakened balance sheets. Neither of us needed necessarily help uh, to prop up that balance sheet. And that's a situation in the second largest country in the world that is really worth fighting for and preserving because mm. without that, competitive dynamics would fall away. And it worries me that a number of national governments are only looking to prop up the flag carrier and not considering how they preserve competition in the process. Well, the, uh, in Europe, the way they're doing that, of course, is by having a, a complete European aviation market. Do you see there being a North American aviation market, a US-Canada one, Mexico later perhaps? It, it could happen. I don't think it will happen in the, in the immediate term because I think you know, we are worried as a nation of 36 million of the nation to the south of us of 300 million, that the, the dynamics would be disproportionately unfavorable um, to the Canadian market. So there are strong arguments to maintain um, those dynamics. But I think that could happen at some stage if uh, it is deemed that actually, frankly, financially, it becomes really challenging um, to maintain um, the equilibrium within Canada. Mm. Moving slightly, Ed, although it's in the sub, on the topic of change, WestJet started, I think it's fair to say, as a low-cost carrier. You've sort of moved yourself from being a low-cost carrier to being hybrid, and then you've indeed now joined IATA. You've got interline agreements. You've, you've got co-chairs, or you had co-chairs. You had interline agreements. Do you think it's inevitable that a low-cost carrier goes up the value chain, if that's the right expression, and becomes a full-service carrier? And I'm sorry, in two halves to that, in both yeah. the short haul market and then the long haul market, thinking of those as two different things. Absolutely. It is largely proportionate, I think. The, the degree of inevitability is proportionate to your home population. 
you know, again, I mentioned Canada as a country of uh, 36 million people. WestJet started 25 years ago. When we started, 45 million Canadians flew uh, domestically annually. Now that number's gone up to 90 million, largely because the average domestic fare when we started was around 290 Canadian dollars. It's now 160. So starting as a low cost carrier, starting with the aim of operating a significantly reduced costs and lower fares than our competitor was clearly successful. But you know, if I think of the former fleet pre-COVID where we had 180 aircraft, 15 to 20 of those aircraft daily were filled with interline or international connecting guests. Wow. So I think it's, it's quite difficult uh, in a smaller population to sustain a pure domestic low cost carrier unless you have uh, strong friends and unless you have international connections. And that for us then led us into looking at how we could replicate that pricing impact that we had on the domestic Canadian market, on the transborder market, on what we call our sun destinations to Mexico and the Caribbean, and then increasingly on to transatlantic. And I do believe, much as uh, I think the jury is still out on uh, ultra long haul low cost as, as Norwegian and, and uh, WOW have proven, I do think there is an opportunity to provide the high service levels and competitive fares transatlantically in the way that we have done domestically. So it's part necessity and part seeing a gap in the market uh, that's led us to spread our wings and make sure that we can uh, operate that Canadian service standard uh, elsewhere in the world. And one of the areas that we've had to learn about is how to sell inbound as effectively as we've sold outbound. It's relatively easy when it's minus 50 in Winnipeg to persuade people to leave. It's a harder job to persuade people to come. Um, but nonetheless, you know, Canada has a breadth of uh, wonderful um, tourist attractions and opportunities when the weather is uh, is more temperate. And, and we've been able to demonstrate that with almost a 50-50 balance on our loads on transatlantic flights. Wow. So you really sell that six week period when it's actually serviceable in Canada? Well, we push it out to six months, but oh, uh, do? <laughs> yeah, we just encourage people not to read their phones or not to read. There's their something about truth in advertising there, Ed, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the, what's the difference though? You, you said it. What's the difference between WestJet and Norwegian? Um, why, why are you making a go of it when arguably Norwegian couldn't? Well, we deliberately eschewed the ultra low cost service angle. We went for quite a high density economy configuration on our brand new 787. So we've got 280 economy seats, uh, 28 premium economy and, and, and a small business class service, but a very, very high quality lie flat bed and a very high quality premium economy service. And I think the difference is that this is genuinely a hybrid operation with the emphasis on keeping the cost of the total operation low by having a high density economy cabin, uh, but by upscaling uh, and at the same time, upscaling our rewards and loyalty program to make sure that those two working hand in hand, as indeed, as you previously mentioned, our membership of IATA and our deep partnerships with carriers like Delta with Air France KLM. So yes, it's still operating at at least a double digit cost a benefit over our closest transatlantic competitor, but it offers uh, still a very premium service in in all three cabins. Hmm. So Ed, I can't um, let you go without asking you some questions about um, ANSPs and, and the ANSP market, because you're rarely, so far on Straight Talk, you're rare, you're, you've got enormously deep ANSP experience. What's, the, what's your feeling on, on ANSPs and how it works now that you're on the other side of the fence? Well, as you'd be aware, I crossed the fence twice uh, from to Airways New Zealand and, and, and chair in Canso, and now back in the airline structure. Um, for me, if I had a request or a desire for the ANSP world, it would be think, to, to, to think more that you are in a business to consumer market, a B2C, than, than pure B2B. Uh, one of the objectives I tried to develop at Airways and again within Canso is to really think about the importance of transparency in pricing, uh, to think about what are the cost reductions you're driving for your airline customers, what are the technology enhancements and digital enhancements that you are co-investing in 
And then what are the productivity gains uh, that you believe you will drive as a result? And that's the, the, the kind of the basis of transparency on which I tried to, to drive Airways New Zealand with customers like Air New Zealand uh, and of course with Qantas Group. But I would say having come to Canada, that spirit of transparency unfortunately doesn't carry across. Um, it hasn't been a transparent relationship. We've seen price hikes from Nav Canada of 30%, which I think is scandalous. Uh, I've used that word again. It's combined with price uh, levels from Canadian airports. I mentioned Winnipeg earlier. Winnipeg put their prices up 52% during COVID. So if I look at the Canadian market, one of the reasons I mentioned it's one of the most difficult uh, for an airline to operate, the Canadian customer pays $24 in $100 before they board the aircraft in fees and fares to ATC and to airports. The US customer, the equivalent of $11. The European customer, $15. The Australasian customer, $8. There is no justification for that disparity. And as a former ANSP, uh, now in the airline world, I just ask for greater collaboration, greater transparency around pricing. And when it comes to investments in platforms like um, ADSB, just check with the airline first whether it's something the airline actually wants or will take advantage of. You don't want ADSB? Is that what you're saying? I struggle uh, with the benefits of ADSB. For me, the benefits on a day to day basis are in performance based navigation and RNP. And that's a practical, grounded skill um, to effectively improve our productivity and reduce our fuel burn. And it's actually more valuable for me right now than space-based surveillance. So one of the questions I've always got, Ed, with airlines is, why aren't you complaining more? Why, why are you so fatalistic about the relationship with ANSPs? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not fatalistic. Uh, I actually believe I've, I've stood in front of the NAF Canada board and told them exactly what I've said. Uh, it's a question of the difference between complaining that you think you're going to get a constructive outcome and moaning where you realize you're not. I'm not a moaner. I am a very vocal complainer. Uh, and I genuinely believe that having put the case for regulatory reform to this government, I think at some stage they will re-examine the user pays basis for airports and air traffic control in this country, in which we are in lofty company because the only other two user pays jurisdictions are Ecuador and Peru. Now, I've no intention of offending Ecuadorian Peruvian viewers of this program, but it just emphasizes for me that we have a reliance on a user pays model that is fine when you have a plethora of users, but when the users dry up, as they have done during this pandemic, then everybody looks to the government to say, we all need financial support and none of the support. Government. So you're seeing ANSPs and even perhaps airports at, as a result of the crisis moving back to national ownership? Is that what you're thinking? I, I don't know whether it's back to national ownership or whether it's you know the sort of uh, privatisation and the sort of expansion policies that DFS adopted in the UK or Nats UK adopted in Spain. I think it's a, a lower reliance on pure aeronautical revenue and building other non-aeronautical commercial streams to make sure that your airline customers don't wear 100% of those charges. But would you welcome competition for airports and or for towers and so forth in Canada? I would, I would Andrew, and I'm very open to the idea of co-investment uh, because I think mm -hmm. that seems to work pretty well in the US with regards to airport charges. And I think anything that steps us out of this relentless kind of lose-lose um, negotiations where we're all suffering from national debt and we're all suffering from the deficit of this aviation industry, I think would be really helpful. So I think changing the investment profile and looking uh, to airlines to say, are you prepared uh, to invest in terminal facilities uh, or even in air traffic control, I think would be very helpful. And, and you are prepared to invest in terminals and maybe ATC and so on? As we regrow, and we, we are seeing now signs already of domestic recovery that will be the basis of uh, growth again in this country, that's the opportunity, not simply saying this is scorched earth and let's assume that consolidation or foreign investment is bound to happen. Let's look at changing the investment profile and let's look at those businesses that came into the crisis with strong business models, leveraging that business model to change the dynamic of the industry to we, prevent we, this happening. 
we sort of got away from horizontal investment, didn't we, over the years, you know, stick to your knitting and all that kind of stuff. But you think there's an argument to go back to it? I think there is an argument to now to consolidate um, the foundations of the aviation industry to remove the boundaries between airlines, airports, air traffic control, and actually say, how do we all have common objectives and how do we all have financial skin in the game to encourage each other? This this is a really interesting subject because one of the things that we seem to have seen as, as airlines are cutting costs and so forth, increasingly they're outsourcing they're, they're retrenching their own staff and then outsourcing ground handling and check-in facilities and so on. And it's one of the classic low-cost carrier sort of models. So I was going to ask you, how skinny do you think an airline has to be to still be an airline? Does it have to have its own reservation system? Well, clearly not. Does it have to have its own cabin crew? What do you think is the core of an airline? And then, well, I was going to ask you that question, but I think your answer is we've got to think of it as the core of an aviation industry, as one single thing. Yeah, that is my view, is that I think there should be a co-investment right across um, infrastructure in a, in a country that, you know, I come back to saying we've only got 36 million people and uh, the second largest geography in the world to support. So I think having that co-investment, that position of equity and therefore all working towards the greater good of the growth of aviation of Canadian aviation for me is more important than who writes the paycheck for the individual because that's the key to supporting growth the aviation industry in Canada supports around a quarter of a million jobs directly around three quarters of a million jobs indirectly it's that indirect number that actually for me is a more powerful motivator than those people who are necessarily on the WestJet books. Sadly, during the crisis, I mentioned that we dropped from 14,000 down to about 4,000 staff. Mm. We've outsourced our airports, uh, all bar our sorts, four major hub airports, and we've outsourced uh, a lot of our uh, contact center support work and closed contact centers. I would argue we've had um, uh, outsourced suppliers in the US uh, for the last 15 years while we've been operating to the US with no detriment to our net promoter score whatsoever. So I think there are services where, provided you work closely enough with your contractor partners, there's absolutely no dichotomy uh, in your brand proposition and your brand delivery. And those are areas worth exploring. I'm still trying to think my way through the other thing. Thank you. That's I, I, I think that was really interesting. But your comment that in a place like Canada, we should consolidate, Australia, I guess, would, would fit into that market, New Zealand, maybe Australia and New Zealand together. But you think, in effect, what we need to do is create competitive poles to be able to take on the American industry and the European industry? Is that what you're saying? I think what we need to make sure is that we have uh, common investment levels, proportionate investment levels. No one expects necessarily the Canadian government to invest at the level of the CARES Act. But we need to make sure that uh, investment is proportionate to the size of our industry and the size of investment in our direct competitors uh, flying into and out of Canada on a daily basis. That's where I think, but that needs to be channeled into stimulus because, you know, many governments have become very, very focused on simply supporting payroll or supporting processes like refunds instead of thinking, how do you invest in green capital? How do you make sure you modernize um, the average age of your fleet and reduce your fleet age, reduce emissions, reduce noise? How do you invest in return to work stimulus mm -hmm. as opposed to wage subsidies? But, but it's it's less a question of getting money from the state is it as, as changing the policy rules so that you can build a, a unified industry? Well, I think that's at the heart of it. You know, I think yeah. we've had the double whammy here of not getting uh, that kind of stimulus activity, but also operating within the tightest border constraints almost of any country in the world, possibly with the exception of Argentina. And, you know, I... I the New Zealanders back, would argue with you there, I think. New but, Zealanders yeah. would probably argue and, and with some justification. But if I look at, uh, you know, what happened in the automotive industry in, in the early 2000s, you know, when GM uh, were bailed out, nobody ever told them, we're going to give you this cash investment and we're going to tell you to stop making cars. You know, we've had none of that... Mm -hmm. And we've been told not to make any of our base products. To stop making so, cars. Right. So yeah. stop making cars. Don't make widgets. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Sell any of that. Well, but that, that, that yeah. then gives us this opportunity to rebuild in a very different way. 
Interesting, because that leads on perfectly, Ed, to my final question, which is a question I put to everybody right at the end here, which is what role can, can Europe and Eurocontrol play to build back international aviation? What is the role for that sort of international scene? Well, let me, uh, I'll go parochial and then I'll broaden it. So from a European perspective, I'm sure for the regulators uh, who are watching the program today, they will form their own view on consolidation and on mergers. And when we look at a potential consolidation that would give one carrier 94% of the Canadian transatlantic market uh, without meaningful concessions or carve outs, I'm sure that's something that uh, will uh, pique regulators' interest and they'll want to have a closer look at. But from a Euro control perspective, I would come back to a principle I learned early in my ANSP days of best equipped, best served. And I think those carriers, <clears throat> excuse me, who are flying brand new 787s, brand new Maxes transatlantically, I would expect uh, Eurocontrol to look positively and favorably on new entrants to broaden competition and to broaden environmentally friendly uh, competition uh, with the reduced impact, both on uh, emissions, but also on noise. And this where I think Euro, Eurocontrol in encouraging uh, an airline like WestJet to think beyond our current ports of, of London, Charles de Gaulle, Dublin, to think more expansively about Rome, about Barcelona, about Schiphol and other places we could fly. That's the role I'd love to see Eurocontrol to help WestJet repeat the success we've been able to generate domestically and into the US across the Atlantic. That's a really positive note to finish on. And so, Ed, can I just thank you once more for making some time available? I know it's early in the morning for you. We're really grateful that you gave us that time. And we're very thankful for, for what you said. I don't know about everyone else, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm sure you found that as informative and as informative and as interesting as I did. So I'm sure you join with me in thanking Ed. Let me just finish by saying that next we shift from long haul and northern uh, North Atlantic sort of issues to very much European issues. And we're interviewing Mr. Jan Lundrum from EasyJet on the 22nd at 1500. Uh, I really hope you can join us then. I look forward to doing that. I look forward to speaking to Jan. Thank you again to Ed. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very good day.